Hello, bonjour, and tance. I'm Paula Simons, and this is the fifth and final episode of Alberta Unbound. We're calling this one The Alberta We Want. This is the final part of the panel discussion on Alberta's identity and Alberta's future, which I hosted in Edmonton on March 5th, 2020. It was convened in response to all the debate and discussion about Alberta's sense of self and its sense of its place in Confederation in the wake of the Wexit protests, the Buffalo Declaration, and the anti-pipeline protests that shut down Canada's rail service. That seems so long ago now in our COVID-19 world. But I believe the deeper issues about Alberta values and Alberta's political identity that we discussed that night are every bit as urgent and important today as we prepare to face the extraordinary challenges of what our province will eventually look like post-pandemic. So join me as we listen to the final words from our panelists as they tackle some of the questions from the standing room only audience at the ATB Financial Arts Barns. Our guests were Dr. Jared Wesley, Professor of Political Science at the University of Alberta, Dr. Diana Steinauer, President of Yellowhead Tribal College, Doug Griffiths, author and former Progressive Conservative Cabinet Minister, Omar Mawalam, Edmonton freelance journalist and author, and Shannon Stubbs, the Conservative Member of Parliament for the Riding of Lakeland. And this segment begins with a question from the floor, all about leadership, which I've directed to Shannon Stubbs. All right, so the question was, what kind of leadership should we be looking for to address some of these issues? Um, well, I think that's a good question for Shannon, who's an elected politician. <laughs> Goodness. Um, well, I think you touched on it. It is the caring issue. You know, people use this word like about authentic mm. politicians a lot. I kind of hate that because it's kind of a bit of a shtick. It's like the word synergy. You know, some of the, I don't know. Maybe <laughs> I'm talking to people who love it, but these are the kinds of things that make give me creepy crawlies. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I think you've hit the nail on the head uh, that you should be identifying uh, leaders and elected leaders who do care and and who uh, you know can demonstrate a level of nuance. And I think the number one thing you need to look for is people who are servant leaders, and that that is their you know that that's approach to that's their approach to their job as elected representatives. Um, to serve the people who sent them there. Now, I, I'm sure that Doug could have something to add on this, and I'm just going to <laughs> to, uh, to try to make this short. And Doug, can you now? Well, I'm going to volunteer your support on my comment here. Um, it's a real challenge for elected people. Um, that's sometimes why I'm very jealous of, of uh, Paula. <laughs> it's <laughs> difficult to communicate with nuance and in a comprehensive way you know the way the structures are set up even in social media like that's it, it's changed things and I I worry on one hand I um, I like that social media has democratized uh, political discourse on another I would say it does a, a disservice um, in many ways and it's very difficult for politicians so let me just say it this way like back when you didn't and I don't know Doug if you want to jump in and rescue me and help me here but if um, but I, I worked for a for an elected rep a long time ago uh, well not that long because I'm just turned 40 in December but um, you know we the social media thing didn't happen so an issue would break and as an elected representative with policy experts or nonpartisan um, public servants or the variety of people you're looking for to give you advice to make your best calculation as to what to do as an elected rep, which is generally a consideration of your writing, your personal convictions, um, and all the, the vast array of information you're exposed to to do your very best to take a position on something. Um, you had some time to do that, right? With due diligence and in a, you know, in a, in a comprehensive, really rigorous, thorough way. And you could speak in a more complicated, comprehensive way, because media would allow and enable you to do that too. And I would just suggest that while, you know, what I've said you should look for in a leader um, is also difficult. I don't want to overstate how easily it is done or that, or that you, if you get the impression that most politicians aren't doing that, it's not, I would suggest to you it's not necessarily because of intent, but it is related to the realities uh, in which we communicate and are making decisions. 
And I think that actually it's getting more and more difficult. And I really do worry about that for political discourse in the future. I think Doug desperately wants to jump in. And then I do too. Like, you know what I'm trying so, to say? Yeah, I, I okay. do. Um, you know what? I, I would just say that um, I think politics is due for a revolution. This whole, you know, I, I always thought when people are stuck on ideology, they found a solution when they don't understand the problem yet. We need more ideas and less ideology. I don't care if you're left or right. You get too far on one side or the other, and you quit thinking and quit being creative with your problem solving. So my, my rule of thumb, if you're looking for real leaders, it's who I'm going to be looking for, is people who are reaching across the aisle, reaching across the province, reaching across the country to build something. And if all they want is division, mm -hmm. and all they're going to build is walls, mm -hmm. they're not the leaders you want. I... I just want to add to um, what I think we should be looking for in leaders are leaders who appeal to our best values, to the best in us. Oh. Things like in our ability to persevere, um, our optimism. Um, what I don't, what I think we should reject, and I don't think we do that very well, is leaders who appeal to some of the worst in us, our fears, our um, I mean, our, our anger, our rage, sense of entitlement, um, the very human, uh, you know, the, the very human thing of being self-absorbed. I think that is, that's not something that, um, that leaders should, uh, should appeal to. And our, our anger is not something that I, it's not something that I like seeing whipped up and weaponized. And I see that a lot. And uh, we saw that a lot in the last um, couple of years. So that's what I look for and don't look for in a leader. I'll, it can be re I'll be really quick. You, you, can you, can, you, can, you can find people that are acting in a tribal way, whether it be ideological, partisan, or other way, when they're talking about us versus them. And when they're using warlike me metaphors. Right? I think this, As a this person practicing that whole elected role right now, um, I would caution around some, like all of us, around stereotypes or maybe um, attaching what we assume to be motives or in the mind and heart and soul of what you are seeing. Um, I just say that because I take very seriously my role to be a channel for the people who sent me to Ottawa to do that job. You know I do, Paula. We've known each other for a long time. So I, I am, um, I'm not, I feel it deeply. I actually have some difficulty compartmentalizing what is going on in my writing and to the people then that I represent. Uh, emotionally, I can't separate myself. So from that, I take that job very seriously. And here is the reality. Right now, 84% of people sent me to Ottawa to do this job for them in my writing. And I do my best to represent the diversity in everybody in my writing because that's my core responsibility. But at the end of the day, my job really is to speak for them. And it's not going to be the case in every community or every region or every place in Ottawa. But I can tell you on some of the major issues, certainly, that we are dealing with, uh, there is absolutely a consensus in my writing on many of these things. And it crosses demographics. It crosses whether they're in cities or rural areas or the small towns. It crosses um, ages. It crosses the whole thing. And that's partly why this alienation that we're talking about and these growing, you know, um, conversations about the mechanics of what different futures for Alberta would look like is happening. And I just have to tell you in my backyard, which is unique, um, and there are a couple of other areas around the, the province that are, that are like this, um, it is a consensus. And it's not falling along, you know, the different kinds of people that are there. I just sit here. This, this, that's, sorry, this, that's the chore. That's I, want to, I want to say something. It's, it's not a slight on you because I know you're a federal candidate, but... Uh, I don't think it's helping when our premier uses terms like leftist green radicals. I think that plays right into the us versus them that Jared was talking about. Because he's talking about protesters who are exercising a civil right based on their own personal values, how they see the world, how they see the planet, how they see the earth, how they see, um, you know, markets, the economies, what, what their priorities and values are, and then just immediately marginalizing them in such a, you know, pejorative way. Um, you know, I expect that 
on Twitter, I don't expect that from my premiere. I think that's shameful. But, I mean, Omar has has been that rare creature, somebody who's made a career as a freelance writer based in Edmonton. Uh, I mean, do you have... Do you have any? I've actively sought out stories that um, can sort of counter stories to uh, about Alberta and Edmonton. Um, you know, I my I, you know I, I worked. I moved to Edmonton um, in 2006, and up until now, um, so I sort of like came at a good time when there was a lot of you know moving to Alberta, a lot going on in Alberta, a lot of mystique around Alberta. And so it was a good time to be a freelancer. And um, I found that a lot of times the assignments I would get from outside the province um, asked, f you know, they, they sort of suggested one narrative that they thought was, and then I would sort of show them the truth, which was sort of a counter narrative. So for example, um, this, this is an assignment I got from The Guardian when um, Ted Cruz won the, the mm -hmm. first primary in the United States. He was born in Calgary. And so they wanted me to uh, check out Calgary and write about how elated Albertans were <laughs> that the next president <laughs> might actually be an Albertan. And I could not find a single right? Albertan yes. who liked Ted Cruz. I talked to conservatives <laughs> like conservative poly policy makers makers who were like, yeah, that guy's garbage, that guy's dangerous. <laughs> the only person I could find who liked Ted Cruz was actually a liberal, and the only reason that he liked him, he's like, yeah, you know, we're around the same age, we were born in the hosp same hospital about a week apart, and I just think it would be kind of cool. <laughs> All right, I think we have time for exactly one last question. Um, uh, there's one here and there's one. There's, I, have, I have conflicting last Sorry, Jared questions. just showed me a picture of uh, Kenny and Ted Cruz together. <laughs> you didn't ask every Calgarian. <laughs> he was in Ottawa at the time, in fairness. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> all right, so. Uh, all oh, right, was that the so, deal breaker for you? Jason Kenny likes Ted Cruz. You're like, I'm done with him. All right, so you, said, you think you have the last question there. I think I have the last question here. I don't know. Maybe I have two last questions, but there are mini donuts and there are pierogies. And I told the caterer pierogies. to be ready at nine. Yeah, there. I, I, I know when I, I when I when I ordered the the catering, they sent me the menu, and I'm very mindful that I'm spending your Senate tax dollars. So I did not order any booze. I'm sorry uh, to tell you this, but I did not think it was a good look for me to use my Senate budget to buy alcohol. You're right. However, on the caterer's menu, one of the options they offered was a, a canapé that was mini pierogies and slices of kubasa on skewers. And so, of course, there is hummus, but, um, <laughs> but and there are bison sliders, but there will also be mini pierogies on That's sticks and mini donuts. So I, I did my best to be, to be on point. Um, all right, who has the best last question? At this point, I have to jump in from the post-production studio, which is actually my bedroom uh, here in COVID town, to provide a little bridge, because you couldn't make out that question from the floor. The question was a good one, though, if I wanted to be sure that you heard it. Given Alberta's tendency to vote for straight slates of conservative MPs, how do other Albertans get their voices heard? That's a really good question. Uh, I'm going to take that one first, and then I'm going to throw it out to other people. Uh, I'm a nonpartisan independent senator. I represent Alberta. Um, technically, I don't represent Edmonton and Northern Alberta, but that's sort of functionally how it works out. Mm -hmm. I recognize that even though, um, apart from Heather McPherson, the NDP MP who represents this part of the city, uh, Albertans, including Edmontonians, elected a straight slate of conservatives, that in our first past the post system, that doesn't mean that every Edmontonian is a conservative. And it's one of those conundrums of the same city that elected a nearly straight slate of New Democrats provincially elected conservatives federally. I'm doing what I can as a senator to try and represent the diversity of this community. This event is a small part of that, but it is a challenge. I mean, the flip answer is to say vote for different other people, but um, but it, it it is a challenge, and 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 I'm sure that um, you know in in Shannon's writing, as she's pointed out, she you know she won by a landslide, but 
but I, I know she's aware too that that, that that doesn't mean that every single person in Alberta shares shares that perspective and it is it is tough to make sure all those voices are, are heard and, and and heard well mm-hmm. now, Jared you, you lean towards the microphone maybe that's just me no well I, I'm gonna go back to Omar it's something that Omar said that it, it really resonated with me the, he said the Alberta I want is the Alberta that exists so I wouldn't say you need to go out and vote for somebody different. So you need to go out and vote. Voter turnout yes, that alone would, in that these provinces help. is that way. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I, yeah, I, I would... I keep coming back to this pair of women that we met at McEwen University when we were doing our focus groups. Both of them drew Joe uh, in terms of their Albertans. And I asked, well, why did you draw Joe? And both of them said, well, that's my dad. They weren't sisters. They were both different dads. <laughs> um, and I said, well, why did you draw your mom? So I never thought of that. You said draw an Albertan. So if Omar is right that that the the Alberta that we want is the Alberta that exists, part of what comes from political, what starts political change is getting over the hurdle of what we think is acceptable or politically correct, or what we expect is going to happen at the outcome of an election. I think a lot of people are held back from voting the way that they want to vote because they don't think that that vote matters. So I think. What I try to do in my research is to expose the, the disjunction between the myths and the reality. And what average voters like you folks in the room do with that is up to you. This has been wonderful. I want to thank all of the panelists for taking part tonight. Doug, Omar, Diana, Shannon, and Jared. This has just been such a privilege to host. Thank you all for coming out. Thank you all for coming here this yeah. evening. Thank everybody on the live stream who's been watching. Thank all of you in podcast land who are listening to this sometime in the future. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and I want to thank again the folks at Studio Theater who have made uh, all of this event possible very seamlessly and wonderfully. And now I invite you to eat pierogies on sticks. <laughs>I'm so sorry. I cannot offer pierogies on sticks to those of you listening to this podcast, but I hope you've enjoyed this discussion, and I hope it will whet your appetite for more such events and podcasts in the future as soon as we can safely gather again. Thank you to our fabulous panelists, Shannon, Doug, Diana, Omar, and Jared. You make me proud to call Alberta and Treaty 6 Territory my home. Alberta Unbound was edited and produced by Ame Charnalia. The live event was produced and directed by Cynthia Wagner. A thousand thanks to all the folks at Studio Theatre in the ATB Financial Arts Barns and to everyone at Fringe Theatre Adventures. Dear Fringe friends, we will miss your festival desperately this summer. We will look forward to fringing with you again when the pandemic is over. And thanks, it must be said, to the team from Bridges Catering who provided our very on-point theme food. It was delicious, though you'll have to take my word for it. I know this is a tough time for Bridges, too, and so many other businesses in Alberta. Thank you, everyone who took the time to listen, for being part of this important conversation about Alberta and its future. Stay safe. Stay well. Stay brave. Thank you. Merci. And hi-hi.